You're listening to the AdCast with your host, Eric Elliott. David, how you doing, man? Dude, I'm good. I'm, I'm loving the uh, music intro. I mean, I didn't realize it said it had the mic muted, right? But I didn't realize <laughs> the video was still going. So I'm just like, I was literally like about to freestyle during that 30 second intro. Yeah. It was, uh, no, nah, man, I'm, I'm good right. this morning. You want me to start this thing over and give you a beat so you can just go freestyling from there? It's that kind of episode, man. Oh man, I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want to. I don't want to subject your listeners to any of that. Oh God, I already have to subject my team to that. It's. Uh, I'm good, man. I, I want video proof, man. I want video proof, David. Man, I want to welcome you to the show, man, David. I'm I'm so excited to talk to you, man. And uh, you know, you got a you got a really rich past, man, and and also a bright future. And I want to go into a lot of that stuff today, man. But for those folks who've never heard of you before, David, go ahead and go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience, man. Oh man, I always I always have a hard time doing this. Uh, so I am David. Uh, I am the founder, CEO, creative of Bokeh, which is an integrated creative agency that started in mm -hmm. the Bay Area, uh, but is kind of everywhere now, just because. Uh, I turned my office into a glorified storage unit at this point. Wow. Um, it, it houses some desks. And I mean, we've just been fortunate enough to to work and, and grow alongside, you know, some of the more recognizable and iconic sort of names in tech and yeah. really uh, establish ourselves and learn about marketing and mm -hmm. advertising as we mm -hmm. did. And so that was that was an has been an extreme blessing. Yeah. So, you know, David, and, and, you know, like many of us who run, you know, agencies, it's not like we go to college and we say, you know, hey, when I get out, I want to start an ad agency because marketing wasn't something that you went to school for, man, you know. Um, so tell me about how you got into the marketing space. Let's talk about that. Yeah, you know, this is something that I was thinking about. Uh, I was listening to a couple of your shows and then I, you know, in doing a lot of these shows and. And I find that there's a ubiquity to the uh, uh, to the origin narrative, which I kind of mm -hmm. find a lot of people stumble into the industry or this fall into the industry. Right. And as I was starting to think about that, like, and I'm not trying to be woke or anything like that, but I think we got to start to change that narrative because it is kind of not like not everybody like there are some people that have legitimately fallen into it, right? But there's yeah. a lot of yeah. privilege to be able to just fall into your profession or fall right. into a career, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're exactly right uh, in the fact that I didn't study marketing. I didn't study advertising. I didn't study branding. I'm not a designer. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't study business, right? Mm -hmm. I was, I studied film and digital media and politics. I did some grad work in film and television production. And then I never worked in an agency. I never worked yeah. in advertising. I never worked in any of these fields. Before right. I decided to start an agency, who does that? Like, there we a, do that. A good, we do that. David. We do. <laughs> we do that, right? But like, I'm I'm extremely blessed by a lot of the forces sort of around me that I can't even Same. necessarily quantify to yeah. have been able to get this to have people be willing to open the door for me, right? Wow. And so, I mean, coming from coming from my background and doing this, like, you know the the honest answer to how did I fall into, how did I fall into this is that I discovered as a, as a 22 year old that if I pitched mm -hmm. a good enough creative, uh, if I pitched and justified an idea well enough, I could have a corporation pay for my travel. And as a millennial, right. Wanderlust, like wow. that's all I wanted. I just wanted to travel. And so, you know, I remember being at, at Google and uh, doing a European uh, sort of campaign. And it was my first time out of the country. And, you know, with Google, okay, I could, I could spend 300 whatever dollars on a hotel. I was just like, I never did the backpacking thing. Can you pay $15 <laughs> for a hostel? <laughs> Man, you know, you know what, though, you know, I want to go back to what you said, though. And, and it's, it's true, though, but it doesn't mean that just because you didn't study marketing that you can't be a great marketer. Because usually it's a lot of those life experiences or even career experiences or things that you've been through that actually help you when you start marketing. Like me, I started in the restaurant industry. So when I started in the restaurant industry, 
the one thing it taught me was people, which is the hardest part about any business. You know, you can really sit down and you can teach someone how to work Adobe, but you can't teach people. You have to learn people. You know what I'm saying, David? No, absolutely. No, I mean, that's everything. Probably the most formative job that I had out of college was my first job, which was working behind the genius bar of an Apple store. And mm-hmm. there is nothing that's going to humble you faster than right. whether it's working in a restaurant or working in retail. Like you are on your feet like mm-hmm. 10 hours, 12 hours a day mm-hmm. servicing people. Right. And that humbles you in that particular situation. What I mean, in retrospect, I realized I was doing was I wasn't just fixing a technical problem, right? You know, I was essentially fixing a relationship with a brand, right? People have such an intimate relationship with their computers or their phones. They use it for work. They use it for communication. They use it for social media. They use it to interact with their world, their network, their community, right? And so when they were coming into the store, they reached a boiling point to the fact that they were so frustrated with this issue or this issue has kept them from their community or kept them from being plugged into the people or the business that actually matters in their life. They Mm -hmm. hit such a precipice that they had to spend time out of their day, drag their ass into the store, whether it's in the mall or what have you to come to 20 miles away, wherever it is, wherever it is to, to come to me and my entire job there, right? was to try to get them, in a sense, not to blame Apple, right? Technical things happen, right? Uh, Sometimes uh, you can't help it. And so my my job is like to figure out how to solve that relationship. And not only am I solving that relationship like one person at a time, but what people don't realize is when you're a genius, you have multiple cues. Mm -hmm. And so you're actually, you know, servicing uh, within, you know, a 10 minute appointment, two or three customers at a time. And so not only do you have to find a way to align with them to validate their concerns, but then you have to find a way to do that in a way and then allow them, you know, excuse yourself. So you could do that with another person at the same time and another person at the same time without making anybody feel like they're playing second or third fiddle. Yeah. So that was an incredible uh, that was an incredible experience that in all honesty, for like a shy little Jewish boy coming out of college, uh, really, (laughs) really helped me develop sort of a language to relate with people. You know, that's the kind of experience that you can't buy, though. And, And you talked about like you might have two or three different appointments going on at one time. But, David, think about this, though. That set you up to be able to learn how to create. Because like you said, you were making a connection with helping people make a re reestablish a connection with a brand. So through creative, I want to talk about your television and your film life as well too, because you were doing the same thing when you were actually creating and studying film, man. I mean, with, with film, you know, it was, uh, storytelling has always been a big part of my life. It's been something that, I've used as a tool to sort of study myself Mm -hmm. um, as well and figure out my identity Mm -hmm. and my place in the world through the Mm -hmm. stories I write, through the films that I make. And uh, I mean, a big impetus also, I mean, it wasn't just the travel. I don't want to be so superficial with it. But when me and my partner, Doug, who I went to film school with, Mm -hmm. um, we were sort of like the director and cinematographer combo, you could say, we just wanted an excuse to keep our hands on a camera coming out of that. And so we looked for any excuse at all. So the foundations of Bokeh, Bokeh started as a video company that did wedding videos, that did uh, surprise engagements as well, that did um, that did uh, maternity videos, uh, which are which are interesting in their own right. Uh, yeah. You know, all of these sort of like anything and everything that we could get our hands on to keep our hands and keep ourselves creatively active. We did just because we didn't want to lose that touch with actually like making something. And it's so humbling to look back on that because, you know, at the time, God, I remember us celebrating when we got a gig that was $500. Like yeah. <laughs> $500. I could, sp- I could right. spend that now. And, and I, this sound, God, this sounds really like, I don't know if it's. And, and that could be a, ever. that could be a, mem- that could be a memory card <laughs> now. Yeah, I mean, I could spend five hundred dollars in like fifteen seconds now, right? Like, money goes in and money goes out so yeah. quickly as you grow. 
But at the time then, $500, like, oh my Lord, that was some, that was some real, that was some real scratch. Yeah. <laughs> David, what's, what's your approach to creative? I mean, cause every project is different. So how, how do you approach a project? You said that you guys were always looking for a reason to keep your hand on a camera, but how do, how do you approach creative? I mean, do you mean from a, from a creative standpoint, when I'm thinking about like, okay, how, how are we going to solve, you know, the, how are we going to reach the outcomes uh, that this brief is trying to get to? Or what is the story we want to tell? Mm -hmm. I always think about how am I going to convince my dad to buy this product? How am I going mm. to explain it to him? Wow. My father is not like so out of touch or anything like that, but he is a baby boomer and he is a Jewish man. And he is going to be hard. Like you're going to have to convince him like, am I really going to spend this money? How do I justify spending it? So if I can convince my dad to buy your product, if I can convince him to do it, then I can convince anybody. And I think ultimately what that's getting to is like just being humble to the actual like lived experience of your audience, right? Like, mm -hmm. and not, and not, and not being so divorced from, from that. I think sometimes, especially in technology, we enter into this sort of bubble. Um, where what, what do you mean? Tell we, me, tell me what do you mean by that? We enter this bubble where we think we're really like changing lives or really disrupting and, you know, disrupting like the paradigm or whatnot, but we forget about that. Like, the reasons why people do what they so you know you mentioned a brand like coinbase and i have a lot of admiration for mm -hmm. coinbase i also have a lot of you know uh, cr critique for coinbase now i try not to judge a brand based off of their past or, or bad pr moments or anything like that i try to judge them off of their mission and where they want to go moving forward right good point but i think it's hard for us to you know when you look at some of the issues that like a, a brand like Coinbase has had when it's come to like diversity and inclusion or what have you. Right. And then, you know, maybe some of the standpoints that, uh, you know, where they haven't taken more of a frontline approach to speaking out. Well, I mean, a reason for that is like, it's a privilege to be able to invest in, in, uh, in cryptocurrency and yeah. what demographic of people do that. And so I think you need to be humble and true and honest to the fact that like, hey, this is actually what our audience is, right? Our audience may spear, like lean more in this direction or lean more conservative or may lean more towards, you know, wealthier people or people who have more disposable income. And so mm -hmm. if we know that and then diversity, inclusion or what have you is something that is going to be a consideration for that. How do we use creative or how do we reshape? Like, how do we how do we pivot or build our brand to be able to be more inclusive to that because we're going to need to bring you know it low we're going to need to bring those people into the into the space so right i don't know you want to be a brand you want to be no I, I get what you're saying you yeah. know but you, what what another thing too is like in in recent weeks uh diversity and inclusion has come up a lot and, and and especially when it comes to creative, because, you know, there, there was a time where I may have the best idea, but I would not be considered or you, depending on how people looked at it. So do you do you feel like uh, now that DEI or diversity and inclusion is on everyone's radar, that better creatives being seen, it's being heard or people are being listened to that once were not listened to? Uh not necessarily. I think that we still probably have work to do, right? I think mm. for myself, uh, you know, and this is where kind of going all the way back, where it's sort of like the pri like a privilege to fall into something, to fall into a career. Like there is no way for me to know, to right. quantify, like mm -hmm. the way that my identity, even though like I'm 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 clearly very like I'm very Jewy. And they, mm -hmm. they, Jewy. But even though that, like, there's no way for me to quantify how just the fact that I was an ambitious white male, mm -hmm. like, really helped me move up, right? How growing up in the community that I did and having the educational opportunities that I did really allowed me to step into creative, right? Like, the to be creative is very much of a privilege. And that's not to say that you can't do it. Like if you come from um, less privileged sort of neighborhoods or anything like that, 
Right. There's a reason. There's a reason why, like diversity and inclusion, is a conversation because a lot of times, not only were those people locked out because of maybe systemic things or implicit biases or what have you, but it was just right. not necessarily like you got to put food on your plate and like just cry, like creating little things in your bedroom isn't necessarily going to do that, right? Like, yeah. what is the actual actionable? So I think, you know, one, we have to humble ourselves to that reality. And then we have to continue to look for those voices, right? As an employer, it's kind of hard because I can't, you know, diversity, include having a, a, a diversity of different mindsets, perspectives and backgrounds. Like I want that. I crave yeah. that. Right? It, it makes it, I, I believe it makes it, it, it kind of opens your thinking more, you know? Absolutely. But I also have to like, I can't necessarily like go in and say like, all right, all I want to do is interview women. Right. Yeah. So I have to, I have to approach every, you know, everybody from a standpoint of equity and measure people on the merits and measure people on their creative. What I try to encourage and what I try to do myself is I try to see through a resume. Mm -hmm. I try to see through a portfolio at potential. Right. Because, you know, sometimes that gets hidden with the big names people have yeah. worked with, or the big brands people have worked with, or the big agencies people have worked with, and realizing that some of that opportunity to work with those agencies, to work with those brands, is a function of just whatever privilege, whatever I can't quantify, whatever, you know, I don't know, they were able to get in, whereas, you know, this talented designer from Birmingham Right. Mm -hmm. They're working with a lot of like companies or a lot of just like local businesses in Alabama that I had never that I never heard of that don't necessarily look shiny to me. But the work that they do looks great. And so I have to see through that and see what their potential is and how I could apply that to something bigger, something maybe they didn't imagine being able to touch. Right. Uh, so those are the opportunities that I look for. I think that it's good to have these conversations because it makes it like more front of mind. But yeah. I think it's more, I think what's also important is that we're not just having the conversation, the conversations from a superficial standpoint, right? Like, Oh, we just need more diversity and inclusion and equity yeah. and whatnot. Like we really understand what that means because of the way that the industry was built because of the way creative was built and shaped and because of how like in our own lives, we benefited from those like systemic things that were built to allow us to rise, that's going to enable us to then break that down and open that up to more people. Gotcha. Do you believe, I mean, that's a great point. I love, I love the way you articulated that. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that some brands kind of value more of the outcomes more than they do the output? I mean, I, I think that's, you know, when it, when you, when you talk about outcomes and outputs, do you mean in terms of like a campaign? Do you mean, in yeah. like what do you? Yeah, exactly. Like, especially around this time too, you know, people are, you know, really, they, they, they're all always thinking now, like, uh, you know, what could happen if we launch this where a long time ago, they didn't think that way, you know? I mean, I, I think in, at least from my experience, what I noticed, and this is what probably, uh, was an observation that allowed me to think, oh, I should start my own agency, was mm -hmm. there was a disconnect between the way agencies were communicating and the way brands were communicating, right? The way mm -hmm. briefs were built and the way campaigns were run. And wow. agencies, I found, were thinking and tend to think in terms of outputs, right? Uh, which tend to tend to like it, not only like oh this is the television campaign oh this is a social campaign but really like oh this is on television what else can i how else can i stretch it oh look at how this applies to ex, you know experiential oh look at how this applies to out of home look at how this applies to this how did this applies to that they're really trying to stretch it like how much more can i get you to buy right hmm. thinking in terms of outputs and they think about the process in terms of like how do we get this done how do we get this done and so anything that deviates from that process now becomes an overage right being and learning about marketing and advertising and being exposed to it from the other side of the table i realized that what we're shaping these campaigns were not outputs Marketing managers, product marketing managers, brand managers weren't saying I need a television commercial right now, right? They were saying, they were saying, hey, this is the outcome we need to drive. We need to get more small businesses on uh, to do indoor maps. 
for Google, right? That's hmm. the outcome we need to drive, right? How do we how do we drive that outcome? Well, let's let's create marketing materials that really put the business front and center. Let's tell the stories of the small businesses that have done it in yeah. all of these different markets and let's let's tell the stories of how those have been successful. Okay, great. That, you know, that starts to build the campaign. Okay, how does that story manifest itself, right? Okay, let's do that through video, right? Let's through that through so we're going to collect a bunch of assets. These assets now, they have different lifespans, but if you build them in the right way, they can have more than one lifespan, right? And so now you're starting now you're starting to build a library mm -hmm. of stories, a library of assets that you can not only use for the immediate sort of need, but you can continue to like harken back to or add to 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 live through, you know, to achieve that outcome. And so what I saw is that's how that's what shaped briefs, right? The briefs were shaped by these objectives and were shaped to drive these outcomes. But something, you know, along the way when translating that brief to an agency, yeah. like turn that into outputs. And that became the that became the driving force for the creatives who worked on it. They were inspired by the outputs as opposed to the outcomes. And sometimes there's a disc sometimes, sometimes from the standpoint of a creative, you have to be willing to sacrifice some of that creative integrity. Mm -hmm. Or some of that to realize that, you know, for the greater good, which is the outcome, like you have to do things this way versus the way you want to. Right. And so that's what really and that's this is not an easy conversation to have with creatives. Either, yeah. To get yeah, to cause, cause there's a lot there's a lot of passion coming from a creative. You know what I mean? It's it's like you're, you're in love with what you create. You're birthing something, you know, that can possibly run in perpetuity if if it's if it's done well um you know you think of like uh the life cereal and and the mikey's you know what i mean i mean that's been 30 40 mm -hmm. years ago but people still remember it you know and and we don't know the name of the person who actually created that but they had no idea when they were creating something that would people would talk about it for 40 years and the commercial hadn't aired in 40 years you know yeah. um uh, do you think it's important? I mean, you brought up the brand and the agency. Um, what about if if some people, um, uh, even on the agency side, if they were never a client, could they understand? You know, like like uh, like from the the creative standpoint or the standpoint that we would present to them, if they if they were never on that side before. I think they could try to understand i think there's people that can be very empathetic but i don't know if you can truly understand if you've never been on the other side of the table right mm -hmm. uh you know that was something so when i was at when i was at google when i was i was hired as a content producer um and you know i realized i was brought into the organization at google maps because uh their internal sort of content production studio G was so inundated with demands from across the organization that they couldn't get anything done quickly. Wow. So my role, the headcount that was created was created simply to like get it done, right? Because they couldn't get it done fast enough. Right. And they wanted to get it done fast. So now, okay, we need to be able to pivot. We need to be able like speed and efficiency is what created the role for me right now i was able to take the opportunity like grab a bull by the horns and really like grow it into something that was more than what they expected because the team that hired me didn't exactly know what was involved with content production or how wide it could go but i realized pretty quickly like this is more than just tutorial and educational content like i have yeah. a role in marketing i have a role in operations i have a role in sales right wow um and so then I started to get brought into conversations, not only with the operations team or engineers or whatnot, but now with the marketing team and talking to agencies and having, because I had this production background, I could sort of mm -hmm. audit agencies a little bit. Yeah. And you could smell, where, you could smell out, you could smell out the bullshit. I mean, that's, yes. I mean, to, <laughs> to put it like bluntly, like, and, and that's yeah. what I started to smell. Like, why are there so many people at the table? Like, why are there so many people on this call? Right. Or, yeah. uh, you know, wondering, like, 
why do I have to talk through so many different layers just to get to the creative who's going to change this, who I just need to change this one thing? So I saw these sort of inefficiencies. I also didn't understand because I never worked in that structure, mm-hmm. like why all of those different layers existed, right? Mm-hmm. And then I just didn't, like it, to me, just the whole, how it was so driven by optics. We need this many people at the table or we need this many people on set, almost as if to justify this is why we're charging you so much. Like, and it's not that I want to put bokeh. I like, I don't consider us a budget agency, right? Like right. what I look at it is it's not about the money you spend. It's about how you spend it, right? Like if you're going to, you're going to spend look at it, you, like you're going to spend the same amount. You may spend the same amount of money with me as you do with another agency, but I'm going to spend that money far like more efficiently and more of that money is going to be invested into the work and into the actual people who are like shaping that work. Right. And mm-hmm. to me, that's money better spent than money that's going to be spent to support a lot of overhead, a lot of juniors that are kind of like, you know, spinning gears on your work. And right. then ultimately like an experience that makes you question whether or not you ever want to work with an agency again. I uh, man, damn, you bring up a great point. Cause I, 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 I do believe I, I remember my days of seeing the agencies that would put on what we call the flex, you know, bring, you know, 13 people to a damn meeting and only two of them are talking. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> the, the, the old flex. Yeah. But it, how is it now? I mean, how do you try and run your shop? OK, now different from what you've seen in the past from other agencies. Uh, how do I run it now? I mean, I think, you know, a lot of. Because when I started the agency, I didn't know how to build an agency. So that was both very liberating as well Mm -hmm. as stupid, right? Uh, Liberating in the sense that like I had no, I had no template to follow so I could create my own template. Stupid in the sense of like, I really didn't understand why layers or roles existed Mm -hmm. to be able to, like I had to learn, like I started the agency with an idea of like, why do account managers exist? Like this whole accounts layer, I don't understand it. It seems like all it is, is a bunch of people leading horses to to water, right? Like they're just relationships, like everybody, whether you're a creative or, or, or producer or whatever, like why do I need to pay somebody to have empathy? We should all have empathy. We should all be able to ask the client, hey, how are you feeling about this, right? Like, why do I need a role for that? And so I, I, I built the agency. I started the agency with the idea of like, maybe we could, account, we, we could cut wow. this layer out entirely, right? And actually on a, on a project and campaign level, we continue to function that way, right? So the way that I connect clients to the agencies. You're not speaking through an accounts person. You're speaking directly to a producer and to a associate creative director, what we call a duo. So you're connected to these two leaders who guide the team and bring the right people into the conversations when they're needed at all all times. So always somebody who has touch on the, on the work or the campaign itself. And -hmm. that continues to be a very effective way to actually run like, projects and campaign level like briefs. Now I've learned the hard way that actually that that structure doesn't work as well in like a retainer environment when we're an agency of record. Right. That's where having exactly. an account manager, an account director is actually extremely useful because now you have this strategic sort of oversight, this relationship oversight that can help, you know, kind of uh, quarterback where information or where client feedback needs to go across yeah, multiple and, and, teams and tee things on. up and tee things yeah. up for you. And so I had to, I had to learn that uh, I had to learn that in transit. Right. And so in one respect, like this premise of not needing account managers, account directors and account level works extremely well and clients like it because they're much closer to the work and as you know, younger, you know, as more millennials, as you enter into the sphere of marketing, 
we all like to think of ourselves as creative and we're, mm -hmm. we're brought up in a social environment that allows us all the tools to create. And so being able to open that up to people and make it collaborative, being able to invite people to set, I always tell, um, I tell clients that like, Hey, you know, they're like, Oh, how many people can we have on set or, or, or can we come? I'm like, yeah, you're more than welcome to come. You're paying for it. Like, of course come. But uh, I just want you to know, like, this is a no frills environment. If you come to set, you're part of the production team, right? Like, I'm not going mm. to get a trailer for you. I'm not going right. to make any special accommodations for you. You eat all the same food. You're on your feet the same amount of time. I may set aside a table and a monitor so you could see what's going on and you have a place to, like, set up your laptop, right? Yeah, but, but this, this is, is business. Like, this is this all is, business. Is, like you're part of the team, right? So I expect you to collaborate. Like you stand up, like in set, like, you know, we're working together. I'm not kind of, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not responsible either for your, unless you tell me to, unless you blindly tell me to, I'm not going to get your hotel. I'm not going to pay for your taxis. I'm not going to do any of that. Right. Like right. I want to put that into the work that you're paying me for. And but you, you know, please come along, like, let's do this together. And most people are like, actually, uh, you know, completely uh, down for that, right? They're like, yeah, let's, let's jam. Right? Yeah, and um, of course, there's going to be some who are, you know, they want to be pampered if they're on set. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really good at, I'm not really good at the pampering aspect of this I, i've never i mean i never really learned how to uh how to button up necessarily right. like for the longest time I, I i have new shoes now but for the longest time my partners would they like david will you buy some new shoes please <laughs> you're going into meetings with like chusky like the ceo of airbnb or you yeah. know meeting with like high marketing people and you have these beat up ass vans with the bottoms <laughs> falling out Right. And you have like holes in your pants and, and like, oh, man, what do you do? like you represent us and like, yeah, but I can only be myself. And, you know, like shoes are expensive. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, David, but let me ask you this, though. Uh, when I go into a meeting, I wear a pair of sneakers. And and I I've found that a lot of times the people that we're meeting with, they don't care what I'm wearing. Not at all. No, I mean, I've, I've found actually it's. um. Uh, as you move further east, uh, the formalities become more like greater and greater formalities I found right in terms of the people I'm meeting with. I think mm -hmm. as like more and more of, uh, you know, uh, Gen, uh, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, like as as, you know, we move up in marketing, like it become it will mm -hmm. become more and more casual. Right. But like my way, my style of working, it's very um, endearing to people once they meet me. Like mm -hmm. if I'm meeting with somebody in Europe, they find it really endearing, very casual. They actually like it. Right. But it doesn't yeah. help me get through the door initially. Like I have to meet them. Right. Other And, and they're mm. going to be a little bit off put. Right. Because like, yeah. who is this guy? And I can only use the fact that like I'm like this is where it's helpful to be able to say, oh, I'm from California. Like, oh, from San Francisco. <laughs> because then they're like, oh, that's that's why. They're right? like, oh, that's why. That's why he's wearing that t-shirt and those jeans and those vans. <laughs> yeah, this this is why he's, he's he come up in this conference room in rainbow sandals, like Jesus. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, no, you're right. Like, you know, I I don't have to worry about sort of those optics, and which is nice because we can be casual. And those are the types of relationships I want to foster, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's it's about, I think uh, one of your other guests talked about like putting the fun, you know, they want it to be fun or putting the fun back yeah. into like the work that you're doing. Um, and for me, it's just like, uh, you know, I want to be able to break down those layers of formality to the point where uh man i need a lot of relationship advice sometimes i don't know if you do these days i i i i, I became single a year ago now i have to swipe all the damn time like i'm doing work with bumble i'm like yo do you guys have any like sort of secret can you help me with a profile up in here right like i'm doing this whole like i'm helping you launch this thing and like you know, what can you do can you hit can you hook me up with a premium account can you help a brother out here because i don't know what the fuck i'm doing oh oh man anyway <laughs> But like, 
<laughs> like those are the that's oh that's my gosh. <laughs> Uh, David, you, you're killing me, man. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Let me ask you this: like, uh, with your agency with Bokeh, um, and when you are working with or alongside of a brand, I mean, how do you guys position yourselves? Like, uh, we're just the creators, or do you guys kind of say, "Hey, look, you know, marketing director A or B or procurement person, we're part of you, or we're on your team." How do you guys position yourself, and how do you partner with people? I mean, that's exactly, you know, what you said in the latter part was exactly how we want to position ourselves, right? Like, think of us as a uh, uh, a partner, not an agency, which I found so like uh, anybody could say that. But really, like, we want to function as an extension of your team. Mm-hmm. Um, and our job here is not necessarily to, to take complete ownership or monopoly of coming up with the creative ideas, but to foster an environment, a collaborative environment between Great not only our team, but, but your team that allows yeah. the best ideas to float to the surface. Now, yeah. our job is to recognize when those are good ideas or good kernels, regardless of if they come from our team or not. Mm-hmm. A mm-hmm. lot of times the best ideas, like the brand already has, are already inside the minds of the market. They have great stories. They just either don't one recognize those are great stories or two, they don't know how to take that kernel and then like really like start to structure exactly. it and pull it apart and develop exactly. it. Exactly. And sometimes so the best ideas come yeah. from the bottom up, man. You're right. You're exactly. right. You're absolutely right. And so that's that's part of our job is to is to to find those, discover those and great uh, and and create them. But the other part of our job isn't to necessarily say that we do everything. But mm-hmm. to really function, and this is where I say function as that creative extension, that creative partner to help connect the dots, right? We've been fortunate to be able to work in the trenches, to work alongside some extremely talented, not only like freelancers and, and creatives, but like partner agencies, mm-hmm. right? And so our job is to like recognize when it may not be something like entirely in our wheelhouse, but we have an incredible partner that we could bring to the table and, you know, we'll bring them to the table. There's no white label. Like let's all just come together and work as a unified team. Right. Mm -hmm. We know how to work off of each other. And then when it comes to sort of like the SOW, the PO, all of those formalities, we could figure out like the easiest way to do that. They can either fold under, you know, bokeh, Right. And so that you don't have to necessarily go through a whole onboarding process again, which like clients are always sort of like, because it's like if they don't have to go back to legal back and forth, because I remember doing that, going to legal, going to finance, like having to to do that wrangling, like they don't want to. So just make it easy. You're already the approved vendor. Just fold it under like your rates. And we're transparent about that. Or if they want to, you know, onboard the other agency, they can. But that's kind of where I feel our role is. Our role is being that partner, helping to find those ideas, manifest those ideas, discover those ideas, flesh them out. And then whether we execute them or we help connect the dots to those who are going to be in a great position to execute them, we can continue to guide those ideas to fruition. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting when you talked about that, you talked about just different agencies being able to play nice in the sandbox. I remember there was a time where everyone wanted to be the agency of record. You know what I mean? They all wanted to be the agency of record. No, this is my account. I can do any and everything for them. I can do the production. I can do the digital before it was like digital, but now agencies have to have these partnerships in order to kind of serve better, you know, or or they have to work together. Now clients are, it seems like brands and clients are forcing them to work together. You have to play well with other groups if you want to make it nowadays. I mean, that was the marketing environment that that I was brought up in, but I don't necessarily, um, and I remember having kind of this conversation. I remember I, meeting up with, um, I'm going to completely name drop, which may not mean anything, but, but Jonathan Mildenhall, who was the former CMO of Airbnb, went on to form his own brand thing. And and I just discovered if you watch We Crash on Apple TV, a free plug for them for no reason. Uh, he's a character in that really? show. 
right? Yeah, and they casted him as quite a cute character. So I'm gonna, I have to, I have to shoot him a text to let him know, like, man, you were on screen, your character was on screen for like three and a half minutes, right? But man, he was cute. They did a good job. <laughs> like I would be, I would be fucking flattered. But <laughs> like, like I don't know, uh, I don't know who I would be cast as. Like if they casted me, Gilbert Gottfried or R.I.P. Oh, that would have been, that 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 been my. Uh, that would have been my, but, um, anyway, anyways, like I had a conversation with him. I remember asking him, um, the, you know, this is when I was much earlier in the career, uh, what is the, what is the point of an AOR? The mm-hmm. is exactly how you say, it seems like it's, it's better to work with a lot of agencies. And now our experience working with Airbnb was working alongside, um, partner agencies and really like working off of each other towards that goal of launching like uh, experiences. And, you know, he's like, it's just kind of the paradigm. Like you all want, you want to have that agency of record, that one sort of like per like agency that's accountable, but it doesn't necessarily make sense anymore. Yeah. But I think that's where, you know, it comes down to like from a, I think there is, I think what he was hitting upon is that there there's a comfort in being able to say like, hey, this is this is our team. This is our agency of record. They're really like helping us from the top down. Right. Mm -hmm. You have somebody that's accountable, but we're not you know, they're not necessarily building the types of relationships that you traditionally an agency of record would build. Right. These Mm -hmm. long lasting Mm -hmm. multi-year relationships. Yeah. that Because I think that the role of what an agency of record needs to B, change. In my head, the agency of record that says that they can do everything and wants to do everything and touch everything, like that should end, right? Like the role of an agency of record, I think, is somebody who can really like come in at that strategic level, think through campaigns, think through the brand, you know, in uh, like more holistically Mm -hmm. as opposed to just like, you know, uh, in in sort of uh, campaign to campaign, and then is able to connect the dots and knows when to creatively let go, right? Yes. And yes. works that's, and that's helps great. work with the brand itself to optimize and build efficiencies because brands have a lot of creative capabilities in house, and I think you know a big part of our job is to recognize like what's the work that we really want to do, and that is going to have the most benefit with us touching it versus the work that's going to be better suited to be able to like build the playbook and hand off to the brand, hand off to their team to take it in whatever direction they feel is yeah. appropriate, right? What's Who's going to be better suited for it? Who's going to be more responsive to, to it, right? Like performance marketing, like uh, being able to do all of those iterations and different banner sizes and shit like that, right? Yeah. Like, I could give less about that. I'll help. <laughs> like, I, I don't give, a, but I got, I'll build a playbook. I'll build a playbook. I'll help. Like, I'll, I will help create the uh, the the style guide. Like, create the mm-hmm. uh, the initial kit. Right. This is how we can do it. This is the messaging that we can test. This is that we'll build that initial kit. We'll hand that off to you, hand off the playbook, hand off those project, you know, those design files yeah. and let your team run with it. Right. Let your team right. test it. Let your team iterate. And some, sometimes that's all the, that sometimes that's all they need though. It's just, you know, that nice start, that nice push, getting their branding and their materials together. And then this is like, Hey, cause you know, they know their brand better than we do. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that, sometimes that's exactly what it takes. David, how would you describe your agency? How would I describe my agency? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that we're not ad people. And so that means even though we do advertising, we just come in with a, a different perspective where um, we're egoless. Mm-hmm. Uh, we... Uh, how would I describe my agency? Now I feel like I'm in like this sort of like identity. How do, who am I? Uh, who are we? I mean, we just, we just, 
we enjoy telling stories and we enjoy being creative. And I think we're always hungry. We're always thirsty yeah. to be able to get, and that's what really drove that. One of the things that drove me the most, like how does a, uh, an agency that started, you know, with as an excuse to keep your hands on a camera start to build out campaign identities, start wow. to work on messaging strategy and positioning. And for me, it's just always, you know, starts to redesign websites and stuff like that. And to me, it's always just been about getting more and more creative discretion in the sense of obtaining more and more trust from the person on the other side that I'm going to like understand their brand and what they're trying to do and can figure out a way to tell a story that's going to like be appealing and and impactful and drive the outcomes that they're looking for. And so that's always, you know, and that's the same sort of thirst. We we just want we want to build these relationships where they trust us with their brand, they trust us with that, you know, with their intentions, and then they trust us to come up with different stories or, or pitch different ideas that are mm -hmm. going to get us to that outcome. Um and so I, I guess if I were to summarize it, you know, we're not your typical ad people. We're driven by outcomes and not just outputs. Um, and uh, I don't know. We like to have fun. And shit. You, 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 summed, you, summed, you summed it up very, very well. Uh, and I think better than you thought you would, but you summed it up very, very well. Um, in 2022, you know, you know, we made a decision uh, for our shop um, to go fully virtual and be remote. And I understand you did the same thing for 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 Bokeh, right? And what what drove you to that decision? Uh, and and if you, I can tell you what did it for us, but I'd love to hear what made you make the decision to go remote. What well, what drove us to our, that decision is well, actually, 2020 for all of its faults, and there's a lot of there's a lot of faults in 2020. Um, uh, it was an incredible year for Bokeh, where we had to grow extremely fast, uh, mm -hmm. and and we had to hire extremely fast, and we had to do so in a remote environment, and so doing that remotely. While and, and trying to hire people that were based in San Francisco or the Bay Area, mm -hmm. it just didn't necessarily make sense, especially mm -hmm. if speed and efficiency was like our goal. And so inherently, we just cast a wider net. At a certain right. point, we uh, at a certain point, we found that like now two thirds of our team worked remotely. Right. Mm. And we're actually seeing that uh, the remote work. Yes, it's changed the workflow. It's changed the way we communicate. Right. But that change was happening across not across only the country, around the world, everywhere. Right. Our yeah. clients were going through it, too. Right. So there was a lot more. We were extend not only us, but our clients. Everybody was extending each other a lot more grace, which is great. Right. Like, wow. Uh, you know, you're on a client call and then, you know, they're like, oh, man, I I'm sorry. My baby is everywhere. I got to I got to I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> And it was just it was just like, oh, it's all good. It's all good, right? Like, or I come on a client call, you know, what I remember I'm like, hey, I am so sorry. Uh there was I had to get a plumber at 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 my place, something with the the septic plugged, and I'm like literally like it was a shitty situation. I'm just I'm just I mean, I was it was you know swimming in in shit. It was just it, everything went to sh everything went to shit. Everything went to shit. And like David, you can start David. stop with the <laughs> puns, man. And it's just I'm like, hey, like oh man, oh my, oh my god. But uh, yeah. So for us, I mean, it was just like noticing that, like, hey, the the, the dynamic of where our team is has changed. The dynamic yeah. of how we've worked has changed. And then it it just you know as it got to a point where like okay now we can start to think about bringing people back to the office. Mm -hmm. um, mm. You know we're taking we're we're asking ourselves quite honestly like is that going to be the best move for productivity and efficiency? Is that going to be just the best move for for our people? Um, even though we can, should we? 
and doesn't make sense to because technically speaking, even if we did, only a third of the team could come back to the office. What are we going to do? Only require like mm. a third of our team to come into the office every day and then the other yeah. the rest of the team just pl- like plugs in from the far? That just doesn't seem to make sense. And so at that point, we're just like, all right, whatever, let's 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 just do this remote thing right yeah. like yeah and uh and then and i remember after that call uh because it was between me and my partners and then my partner doug who i mentioned before who was my film school you know we started in film school together uh i made the decision i'm like all right let's stay remote and then he was just like okay um i'm moving to portland <laughs> and I'm like you mouth <laughs> he was ready. I want to ask you. I want to ask you about this article you wrote in Campaign Live, and where you said uh, COVID has dissolved illusions of our reality. You remember that? I remember. I remember that line. Uh, I remember that line. I mean, I think in general, in terms of just everything about the way we live and the way we work and the way we balance mm-hmm. work life has changed. Yeah. Some for better, some for worse, but I think actually generally for better. Right. Mm. I think when it comes to the balance of work and life, I see people extending, as I mentioned before, a lot, a lot more grace with each other. And that's, yeah. and that's, that's great. Um, in a business, like when it comes to creative, you know, we've had to, lean into it's forced communication between people to improve right uh especially with create it's like because like building creative is like having a relationship right like you you want your partner to know what's on your mind and and then you're like you should you should know this is what i meant or you should know this is what i want right right yeah like you have to communicate. You have to explain it, right? Your partner isn't just going to know how you feel. The person across from you isn't just going to know like what's in your head. And being in a virtual space really like, you know, makes it that much more important to, to communicate. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you and you are respectful of everyone's time too. Ab- absolutely. And so I think that, you know, COVID, the reality of just the pandemic and how it's, you know, forced us to work, forced us to reconcile the balance between work and life, uh, you know, has has really kind of like dissolved uh, the reality of the way that we thought we had to work or the way that we thought we had to interact or the way that creative had to be made, right? Like I think before the uh before the pen before the pandemic i remember having conversations with my partners about the idea of working or hiring some remote people if it meant we could get better talent especially if they're working in parts of the country where the cost of living was mm-hmm. more advantageous mm-hmm. for a mm-hmm. startup agency where we're not funded and we don't have we don't ta- we don't have any loans so every dollar we spend is a dollar that we have to make Right. And so every dollar we spend on somebody is very, a very intentional dollar. Like yeah. if I can pay somebody uh, a, a rate that's commiserate to not only their experience, but also makes sense given their cost of living in a different part of the country. And that's advantageous for me over in San Francisco. Right. Like, and, and they're happy. The most expensive and places happy. to live in the country. Yeah. 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 It's dumb. We're, we're dumb. Uh, yeah whatever <laughs> but like uh it, it's all relative in the it's all relative but uh if we could do that why not and before the pandemic you would have been hard pressed for my partners to be like but we need to be in the same room we mm-hmm. need to be able to work this way we need to be able to build relationships with our clients and need to have that in person uh now it's sort of like yeah i can't necessarily like it's 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 kind of erased a lot of those you know predispositions yeah. how projects have to shape and how things have to get built now from a relationship standpoint in terms of building relationships i don't know if i would have started my agency uh in the pandemic 
or in this environment, I don't think I would have been able to get traction, right? Because my wow. my uh, I was I was I was so uh, fortunate that when I shot a LinkedIn message to somebody at Airbnb or somebody at Google or whatever saying I would love or Instagram saying I would love to meet up and just grab coffee and lunch, right? Like these people actually accepted like a message from wow. just like a random kid to get coffee on LinkedIn because he wanted to learn about what they do in advertising. Wow. And so good. So, man. so many of my relationships were built from that sort of one-to-one -one connection, that in-person connection, because I think that, and, and maybe it's just, you know, this is where I can give credit to maybe my personality is that when I come into a conversation I've been told this is a uh, this is an anecdote. So I uh, reached out to she used to be like VP of global creative at Starbucks. And I reached out to her and I said, hey, I would love to hear about your experience and I would love to hear about your career and everything because she did work at CVS as a high level creative at Target. And I just wanted to kind of hear about her journey. And then she invited me up to Sonoma to do a little bit of a wine tasting. Now, I don't know. I, I, I'm a plebeian. Wow. Man. I don't know. I don't know wine. Right. So I'm at this wine tasting and man, I don't feel pressure a lot. Like, you know, title or whatnot doesn't mean much to me. Like, right. Like if you're a CMO, you're still human. Right. You're still, you're still but, a CMO. Yeah. But, but like when I'm at that table and she's, you know, we have these, this, this, what flute of wine or whatever. And she's like, Oh, tell me what you taste. And, <laughs> And I, 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 I sip it, right? And I don't know what in the hell to say, right? Like, I'm I'm a simple man, right? To me, people are like, oh, what kind of wine do you like? And like, uh, the closer we can get to grape juice, the better. Uh, <laughs> like, like, oh, what, what kind of cocktail do you like? And you're like, uh, you know, just sweet. It. Just sweet. You know, I'm that I'm that type of person, right? Like, like hey, what's your, uh -huh. what's your quote unquote girly drink? Like, oh, it's this. I'll have that. Uh, so, you know, she asked me what, it, you know, what do I taste? And I, I take a sip. I'm like, um, so, so, so grapes. And you know, like, okay, David, that was, that was fun. Um, try again. So I never felt so much wow. pressure. But, you know, wow. then we, you know, and, and I ended, you know, I was so scared. I'm like, I don't know. I taste like dandelion. I'm just pulling out of my head. dandelion and uh, it's like <laughs> yeah. lemon David J. dandelion <laughs> Man. I ate a lot of I ate a lot of things as a kid on another tangent I feel like this uh, like health wise like the pandemic I was optimized for this my immune system was waiting like I spent so many <laughs> years as a kid putting dirt in my mouth putting toys in my mouth putting everything in my mouth that when we oh, got man. to this point like my immune system was like bring it COVID. I'm ready. We'll take you. <laughs> but anyway, so, so in this meeting with this creative uh, VP, you know, I'm asking her so many questions and she's being so open and so candid, like mm -hmm. questions about everything, even questions about like, how much does a VP or global VP of creative make? I have no idea. Like, and she told me everything. Right. And then wow. we're out in the parking lot. And she stops, like we're saying our goodbyes. She stops and, and she said, you know, she looks at me and she said, you know, David, I figured it out. I know what it is about you. And like, what is, what it is about me? What is that? Like, you were just so not suave. You are so not slick that it just makes people open up to you. Wow. And I'm just like, I have no idea. Wow. If that's a not. that's a compliment <laughs> that's a compliment no seriously that's a compliment because you were being yourself and you weren't being anyone else and what she saw was you know hey i can have a real conversation with this person because he's not telling me what i want to hear you know and, and i think that that is one of the key things that we have to have in this business it's just being ourselves just being ourselves and and, and um chris doe who I admire a lot, you know, he says, just take out the word sell and just replace it with the word help. And, and I believe, uh, I believe that's what you do, David. And just hearing how you said you were always looking for an excuse to find a camera 
And you talked about like, you know, you said the money thing, but I don't I don't believe money was a thing that drove you. And especially with a lot of creatives, we want to create is what we want to do. You know, so proud of you, man. I want to ask you a question. Uh, yeah, I want to ask you this question. How much do you think uh, social media has changed the landscape of things for us? And where do you see it five years from now? Uh well, I think social media has changed the dynamic in terms of the way that brands should think about interacting with consumers. They can no longer just set the conversation. Like you mm -hmm. can't just put a campaign out. Like you have to be part of a conversation. Mm -hmm. Conversations are ongoing. Conversations are growing. It's not just about enabling and putting your, your fans, your consumers, your users in a position to tweet, to post, to, to create content for you. It's about actually paying attention to what's going on in the world and mm -hmm. having an opinion or having a way to interject yourself into that, right? Like that's become part of the consumer calculus. How a brand interacts online and on social is become part of the consumer calculus, right? Like what does a yeah. brand say? Like yeah. I absolutely love I love looking up like the smart ass tweets or whatever of Wendy's or whoever. Oh like, my right? gosh. Right? Like, I love uh, that, it, right? it, Yeah. Yeah. I don't eat at Wendy's, right? But but I do know that I'll probably get my kids frosties one day when I have kids. There'll be Wendy's, right? Like those are the these are sort of the things that like love like like I love when you see like uh like me like metros, different metros, like like talk shit to each other on Twitter or something like uh -huh, that. Uh -huh. Like, so, so being able to interact, not only like, and, and have an opinion and speak and, and, and enter a conversation, I think is going to become more and more important if it isn't already important for brands to, to do. And I think they're doing it on the periphery, right? Right now they're noticing like, Oh, like immigration um, and, you know, uh, you know, immigration issues are part of the conversation. What can we say and how can yeah. we speak? What type of campaign can we run? What kind of stories do you tell? And that's where campaigns like, you know, what we did for DoorDash to launch Kitchens Without Borders. That's where that comes from, right? We're noticing conversation happening. We know that like per our brand values, like being able to represent communities of refugees and immigrants and really enable those small business owners is an important part of our brand values. How do we tell those stories, right? Square has done the same thing. Lyft has done the same thing with some of our like incredible friends over at another agency that we partner with uh, mm -hmm. every now and then, even odd. And so like, I think that's happening sort of at the at the periphery. And then there's some brands that are really good just because they can enter the conversation like and and I think that's just going to become uh, a heavier, you know, kind of a, a part of part of this mix that we have to, especially when shaping a campaign. It's yeah. not a bit about like what point can we make or, or whatnot, but like, how can this content, how can these assets, whether it's used now to enter the conversation or, or how could we continue to use this in conversation? Yeah. I, I think it helps, it helps them a lot. It helps them to learn their audience better because truthfully, sometimes they, they think they know their audience, but they don't. And, and I think social is yeah. a way for them to learn them, you know? Social is just this melting pot of ideas and melting pot of perspectives and melting pot of shit. like this. Uh, social media can be horrible, right? Yeah, There's a yeah, lot of trash on it, right? Uh, and but I think that's sort of uh, I think that's humbling. And I think ultimately, though, um you know, and, and not to dive too much into politics or what have you, right? But actually, things are far more like simple uh, in the sense of people have fears that are mm. uh, that that get that manifest themselves in a lot of different ways. A lot right. of times they manifest themselves, at least, you know, what we've seen as of late into like othering and all of that, right? But a lot of times those fears are just about how am I going to 
support my family? How am I, you know, going to like manage in this economic environment? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so if we can, you know, as brands really try to understand what those motivations are, then that's going to give like a lot more sort of when we do our creative, we can start to speak to those sort of things directly, right? As opposed to just dog whistling towards, you know, a millennial progressive or something audience because we want to, we can start to figure out how we can shape that creative and that narrative to appeal to some of those other demographics that although like on the face of it, like they may not, you know, they may, you know, they may, you know, be more conservative leaning. They may be less about, you know, like this or that. They may want mm -hmm. to be able to use the simple thing. When you start to talk about family and children and when you start to talk about like opportunity and all of that, as, at least in, especially in American culture, there's, I think, a rather like strong, uh, like, commonality that we all believe in the same sort of things like foundationally yeah. and that hasn't I, I don't think that ever really changes right and so being part of the conversation or helping to shape a conversation is being able to be able to like take those figure out how you can everything is position everything is marketing at the end of the day right like it's all positioning and how you shape yep. a story which is why I don't understand the Democratic Party. Why do we suck at uh, storytelling so badly? We have so many, right? Man. Get some marketers. There's so many, like whatever. Like uh, well, it's, it's just, a, it's it's just the same. It's the same people over and over and over again. You know, I I, I I enjoyed my conversation with you, man, and I really appreciated the laughs, David. I really do, man. I really do. Uh, David, what's on the horizon, man? Uh, what's on the horizon for you and, and, and Bokeh? And I want you to tell people exactly how to find you and throw out those social handles for me. Oh, goodness. What's on the horizon for us? Uh, well, we're uh, we're finishing up a couple of camp. We're finishing up a couple of campaigns we're, uh, that we're excited about for for uh, brands like Instacart and, uh, you know, working with a couple of startups here and there. Um and then, you know, I think the big thing for us is, you know, we want to we want to spend a little bit of time uh, to kind of focus on ourselves. I know oh, good for point. one, like in, in the sense that I want to uh, refresh our we need to update our website, which has been such a neglected portion of, of this because we, we we get so immersed in our client work that we forget yep. about our own work. And yep. so like our <laughs> website, which is amazing and great. Uh, None of our new work for the last three years is on that website. So you could go to bokeh.agency and you could see the agency we we used to be. Uh, and some of the, and there's good work on that. We have our campaigns for Airbnb and how we launched experiences on that. So that's bokeh.agency. Um, but you know, for some of our newer work, you just want to follow us, you know, on uh, Instagram. That's that's where we like to to post, you know, some of the newer stuff that we put up. Um, uh, again, the handle is at bokeh.agency. And then, uh, you know, you could always just search for me on LinkedIn. I try to be as, as fairly open, um, and responsive as I can, especially, you know, because yeah. doors were so open to me. If I can help either guide people lend some advice or, or point them in a direction, or even if they get on a call to give some advice to somebody who's young and early in their career, like I'm happy to do that. I rather give back awesome. uh, than than treat everything in. I don't know. There's sometimes such a pride that people have in terms of just like, oh, I went, I had to work through it. Um, I had to work through it. I had to figure it out. So you know, they're going to have to too. And the yeah, only thing wrong that with giving, feel, nothing wrong with giving lessons. Yeah, no, the only thing that I feel that way about is Hebrew school for my kids. I had to go, you're fucking going too. There is no, there's no escaping it. I can't tell you why. I can't tell you what it's good for. I can read Hebrew. I don't know what I'm reading, right? But you're going, that's it. End of, con you know, that's, that's oh the only God. thing. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise. Uh, so yeah, that's where you could, that's where you could hit us up and, and contact us. And, and I mean, for me, I'm just sort of excited uh, you know, uh, the world is opening up again. Yeah. Um, I think this creates 
some incredible, we have some really great brands, like DoorDash, Instacart, a lot of these sort of delivery brands, a lot of these more even Coinbase, you could put that, like a lot of these digital brands. And I think the big challenge is how do you start to make that brand palpable in the real world, especially at a time where there's such a thirst for people to get back outside again, right? And, and so that's what I'm hoping to be in more of these conversations. How do we mm -hmm. make your brand more experiential? How do we start to partner with uh, some, you know, some of our agency partners to really bring some, give a physicality to what has been a digital experience, right? How do you actually manifest those experiences in the real world? Because we all want to get outside, right? Yeah, like, we we're all, all do. excited about that. Well, so I, anyway, I think, sorry. I, I think no. I think you just made a segue for us to probably hook up with a do and do a part two. So. We can definitely do that, man. David, it is great talking to you, man. I want us to stay in touch, okay? Um, yeah, no, and sure. I, I want to thank you for being an amazing guest. Thank you for the laughs, man. I'm sure when they listen to this podcast, uh, there's going to be some people rolling on the floor laughing, man. <laughs> Trust me. And I, for those who are listening, I want to thank you guys for giving us your most valuable asset, which is your time. We thank you so much. If you enjoyed the podcast, please feel free to reach out to us if you want to be a guest, or you can also uh, go online and give us a, a nice five-star rating. And we are any and everywhere that you listen to your favorite podcast. This is the AdCast. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's show, be sure to give us a five-star rating. 